Chapter Four. Another murder. Next morning, Kernan had three visitors. The first was Tennyson, with a report that the murder victim had been identified. Second was Ockley, complaining that Tennyson was a bad police officer. We should have charged Marlowe with the murder. We have the results of the DNA tests. We know he did it. She's no good. The third visitor was Arnold Upcher, Marlowe's lawyer. I think you should look at these cases, Chief Superintendent. In each one, the evidence depended on DNA tests, and in each one, the accused was found not guilty. Mr. Marlowe has said he was at home when the girl was murdered, and you don't have enough evidence to prove he committed the murder. You have to let him go. Tennyson interviewed the girl who lived with Karen. The last time I saw her, she was going to work. She was a fashion model. She was always so happy. The girl burst into tears. Michael, Karen's boyfriend, could not help. We argued. I haven't seen her for a few weeks. I was on holiday until the thirteenth of January. When I came home, I telephoned the apartment, and her friend said she wasn't there. Then I telephoned her parents' house, but they hadn't seen her since Christmas. So I went to the police and reported that she was missing. Where were you on the night of the thirteenth? At my parents' home. They'll tell you I was there all night. At six fifteen p.m., Kernan said they must let Marlowe go home. There was not enough evidence to prove that he murdered Karen, and the police had kept him as long as they could. Tennyson broke the news to the other police officers. We keep investigating him until we find the evidence. You shouldn't have let him go, Otley shouted. If Marlowe kills another girl, it will be your fault. That's enough, Sergeant Ockley," Tennyson said. "This case was handled badly from the beginning. There is not enough evidence to charge him, so we will keep searching for more until we can bring him back and keep him here." Tennyson opened her car door. Marlowe ran up to her. "Excuse me, Miss," he said. "I wanted to thank you. I knew you would help me." Tennyson stared at him. He was handsome. He looked innocent. But she knew that he was the murderer. She was certain that he was involved. Marlowe got into a taxi. A moment later, Otley ran up to Tennyson's car. I've just had a telephone call. They found another body. She was attacked, and her hands were tied. From the description, it's Della Mornay. It was after eight p.m. when Tennyson and Otley reached the field where the body lay. It was raining hard and the ground was muddy. The body was covered with dirt. It had been there for a long time. Tennyson looked at the face. I think you're right. It looks like Della Mornay. Although the body was covered with mud, she could see the marks on the girl's arms. They were the same as the marks on Karen's body. You shouldn't have released Marlowe, Otley said. He probably did this one too. I had to let him go. If Shefford hadn't made so many mistakes at the beginning of the investigation, don't you talk about my boss like that, Otley shouted. He was a good policeman. He knew Marlowe was the killer. He thought he'd done another murder in Oldham. What? Why didn't you tell me? He wasn't certain. There must be reports on this other case. I want them on my desk tomorrow morning. And Ockley, if you hide any more information from me, I'll have you moved to another department. Chapter Five. Della Mornay's diary. 
Peter Rawlings was cooking dinner when Jane telephoned him. Sorry, love, she said. I won't be coming home tonight. We found another body. He knew that she must be exhausted. She had not slept for more than thirty-six hours. At the same time, he was annoyed. She had no time to spend with him. She never had time to talk about his work or his problems. He was having a difficult time at work, and he missed Joey, his son. He wanted to talk to Jane, but she was never there. Tennyson stood up from her desk. She had been sitting for hours, and she was stiff and tired. She went into Otley's office to see if he was still there. Maybe she could speak to him and persuade him to stop working against her. Otley wasn't there. On his desk there were some photographs of Shefford and his family. Next to them were the case notes on Della Mornay. She opened the file. Underneath a pile of papers there was a small book, a diary for 1989. With Della's name written on the front page, nobody had told Tennyson they had found a diary. She looked through it. Some pages were missing. It was so late when Tennyson got home that she did not want to wake Peter. She slept in the other bedroom. Peter found her there in the morning, lying across the bed. He took her a cup of coffee. Jane, Jane. What? What? Hey, it's okay. It's me. I brought you some coffee. What time is it? Just after six thirty. I have to go. Oh no! I have to hurry. I have to. She fell back on the pillows. I'm so tired. What time will you be home tonight? Peter asked. Don't ask me. I am asking you. I've hardly seen you for three days. I thought we might go out somewhere for dinner. It was the last thing she wanted to think about. Still half asleep, she drank her coffee. I'll try to be home by eight, okay? She said. Tennyson took Jones with her when she went to look at the body. The smell of the body made her feel sick. Jones took one look, then had to leave the room. She has similar wounds to the other victim, the doctor said. She was killed with a small, sharp knife or tool, deep cuts to her chest and shoulders. Her face was badly beaten. Marks on her arms show that she was tied up. The hands were washed. She must have fought the person who attacked her. She had false nails, and two of them are broken. Do you think the same man killed her? Tennyson asked. I can't be certain, but it is possible. Whoever it was, he cleaned the body well and left no evidence of himself. Tennyson found Joan sitting outside the door. He looked very pale. Okay, she said cheerfully. If you're feeling better, you can drive me back to the station. Sorry about that, boss," Jones replied. "I must have eaten something last night that made me ill." Tennyson smiled. At nine o'clock, George Marlowe left his house and went to the factory where he worked. He did not see the two policemen who followed him. Marlowe worked for a company which made paint. His job was to sell the paint to shops, and he often travelled across the country on business trips, which took him away from home for two or three days. He was good at his job. He worked hard, and his colleagues respected him. They knew that he had been to prison, but he said he wasn't guilty, and they believed him. That morning, nobody spoke to Marlow when he went into the factory. Later in the day, it got worse. When he walked into a room, people turned away. They knew the police had arrested him for murder. They might believe that he was innocent once, but not twice. Late that afternoon, Marlow wrote a letter. 
I am leaving this job, he wrote. I cannot work in a place where people suspect me. As he walked out of the factory, he shouted, I didn't do it! I didn't do it! Tennyson was talking to the officers on the case. She died about six weeks ago. Like Karen, she was killed somewhere else and then taken to the field. She was tied up like Karen. What have you found out, Muddiman? Marlowe went to work today, but he's left his job. He travels a lot. Where was he at the beginning of December? He was in London. Right. So we know he was in London when both murders took place. Have we found Marlowe's car yet? No. None of his neighbours have seen it for about two weeks. Keep searching for it, Tennyson said, and check out the area where the second body was found. See if anyone saw a car like his. It's an unusual model. Somebody must have seen it. After the meeting, she went to see Kernan. Otley was with him. I want to ask Sergeant Otley a question, sir, Tennyson said. How well did DCI Shefford know Della Mornay? He'd arrested her a few times, Otley said. She used to give him information. If he knew her, why did he think the body of Karen Howard was Della Mornay? Her face was almost destroyed. Anyone can make a mistake. What is this about? Kernan asked. I want to know how well Shefford and Otley knew Della Mornay. And I want to know why this, she threw the diary on Kernan's desk, was in Otley's desk. Otley did not reply. There are pages missing, Tennyson said. What was in those pages? the dates when Shefford went to see her. He liked her. He was one of her customers, Otley said. He did not look at Tennyson as he spoke. Tennyson turned to Kernan. I still think Marlowe is our prime suspect. I want him watched all the time. If he's killed twice, he could kill again. Kernan nodded, and she continued. I also want to talk to the newspapers and television about this case, sir. She had won, and she knew it. She walked out and left them there, closing the door quietly behind her. There was a moment's silence. Then Kernan shouted, You fool! You've destroyed evidence! You could lose your job for that! I only tore out the pages which had John's name on them, sir, Otley said. He stared at the floor. He could not look at Kernan. You've been lucky this time. Tennyson could have finished you. Jane arrived home late at night. Peter was waiting for her. I thought we were going out tonight, he said. I forgot. I'm sorry, I meant to phone you, but there's so much happening at the station. The telephone rang. If that's another call for you to go back to work, Peter said, I shall leave you. Jane picked up the telephone. The call was from her mother. It's your father's birthday next Monday, and I'm organising a party, her mother said. We'll be there, Jane replied. After she put the telephone down, she remembered. Oh, no! Next Monday I'm appearing on television to ask for information about Karen Howard's murder. It's one of those crime programs. It's really important. I'm the first female police officer they've asked to go on television. Which is more important, Jane? Peter asked. This case or your father's birthday? Jane did not answer. Moira stood at the bedroom window. She could see the police officers outside watching the house. Why won't they leave us alone? she asked. She began to cry. I just 
want them to leave us alone. They will. I promise you, Moira. I didn't do this murder. They'll have to leave us alone. Why did you have sex with that girl in the first place? Moira asked. I don't know. I was stupid. It won't happen again, I promise. I love you, Moira. Chapter 6 Work and Family Jane Tennyson was nervous as she waited in the television studio. The program was going to start soon. She knew what she had to do, but she was frightened of making a mistake. She was the first woman police officer to appear on a television crime program, and she had to do well. Jane's parents, her sister Pam and Peter, were watching the television, waiting for the program to begin. The birthday party had started earlier, but they wanted Jane to arrive before they cut the birthday cake. Peter, Jane's mother said, can you check the video? Jane wants us to record the program so that she can watch it later. Is the video on the right program, Mr. Tennyson? Peter asked. Of course it is. Now be quiet so we can watch. Otley sat with the other police officers who were watching the program. He hated seeing Tennyson on television. Tennyson was doing well. We know that Karen Howard left the office where she was working at 6.30 on the evening of the 13th of January. She told the people she worked with that she was going home. She never returned to her apartment. Were you in Ladbroke Grove that night at around 6.30? Did you see her? A woman police officer dressed in the same clothes as Karen had worn, appeared on the screen. We know that Karen had problems starting her car. A man saw her trying to start it. On the television, a man went over to the girl dressed as Karen. Got a problem? Yes, it won't start. The man tried to help, but still the car would not move. He shook his head. I think you'd better call a garage. We know that Karen locked her car and walked to the main road. She was never seen again, Tennyson went on. George Marlowe stood in front of the television watching the programme. Turn it off, Moira said. What are you watching that for? Because I want to see what she's saying. Somebody out there knows what happened. They know who killed her. The police think it was you. Well, it wasn't. You have to believe me. Moira watched the television with horror as a car like George's appeared on the screen. Tennyson was saying that the police needed to find the car as part of the investigation. George! she screamed. They've got a car like yours! They're giving out the car number! Marlowe put his head in his hands. Why are they doing this to me? Why? After the program finished, Jane drove quickly to her parents' home. She had forgotten to send her father a birthday card and present, so she bought two bottles of wine from the shop near their house. Well, was I okay? she asked. Did you see me on television? Have you recorded it on the video? Switch it on. Let me see myself. Peter switched on the video. Jane sat on the edge of her chair. The television showed a football match. What's this? You recorded the wrong program. Then she began to shout at her father. There were only ten phone calls to the police station after the program finished. One of them was useful. A woman called Helen Masters remembered seeing Karen getting into a car. She gave a description of the driver. 
He was about five feet ten inches tall, rather handsome, with very dark hair. She described George Marlowe. Jane and Peter argued all the way home. Your father just made a mistake, Peter said. He didn't record the wrong program on purpose. He knew how important it was. He always gets it wrong. You are so selfish. Don't you ever think about anyone except yourself? It was your father's birthday, and all you could do was shout at him. It's always the same. They don't care about my job. They think I should be like Pam and have children. Suddenly, Jane began to laugh. He's done this before, you know. He recorded part of a football match over the video of Pam's wedding. When she opened the door to the apartment, the telephone was ringing. We've got a witness," she said to Peter. A woman saw Karen get into a man's car. She says the man knew Karen. He called out her name, and he looked like George Marlowe. I'm going to question him again tonight. You're going back to the station now. Quickly, Jane changed her clothes, kissed Peter, and left the apartment. Peter lay back on the bed and sighed. Sometimes she really annoyed him. Her moods, her temper. Chapter Seven. A witness. Helen Masters was a good witness. I was standing near the railway station, she said. I saw the man first. He had dark hair. Then I saw the girl. I recognized her later when I saw her photograph on television. The man walked to the edge of the pavement and called to her. You definitely heard him call her name, Tennyson asked. Oh yes. Helen Masters was asked to identify the man she had seen. Twelve men stood in a row. Each man held a number in front of his chest. George Marlowe was number ten. Helen looked at them through a window. She could see them, but they could not see her. Each man was asked to step forward, and shout the name Karen. Eight, nine, ten. Looking straight ahead, George Marlowe called out, "Karen!" loudly. Helen Masters stared at him for a long time. The reception area of the police station was busy. Tennyson thanked Helen Masters for her help, even though she wanted to scream with anger. Helen had not identified Marlowe as the man she had seen. Marlowe left the station with his lawyer Arnold Upcher. As he walked past Tennyson, he stopped. "Why are you doing this to me?" he asked. "I was pulled out of bed at four o'clock this morning. You have a policeman following me all the time. You know I'm innocent. Why are you doing this?" "Get him out of here," Tennyson said. Maureen Havers came up to her. Kernan wants to see you. Tell him you couldn't find me. Marlowe's lawyer is with him. He says you shouldn't have given out the number of Marlowe's car on television last night. You could only do that if the car was reported stolen, and Marlowe hadn't reported it. Oh no! Well, do something about it. We all know that reports of stolen cars can get lost. The report has probably been put in the wrong drawer, hasn't it? Maureen nodded and smiled. Tennyson and Jones went to the factory where Marlowe had worked to talk to his boss. Has George always worked in London? Tennyson asked. He started work in Manchester. We moved the factory to London in 1982. George still travelled around the Manchester area. He knew all the customers. Did anyone go with him? 
Moira always went with him. She had family up there. I need a list of all the places he visited, Tennyson said. Later that day, at a meeting of all the policemen working on the case, Otley told them what was happening. These photographs show the bodies of Karen and Della. You can see that the marks on their bodies are the same. We know that the DNA tests show Marlowe had sex with Karen before she died, but he has explained that. He also has a reason why Karen's blood was on his coat. He says she cut herself on his car radio. We have nothing to link him with Della Mornay. I think his car is important. We've still not found it, but if we do, there may be enough evidence in it to prove he did the murders. So find the car. Tennyson came into the room. Karen didn't fight when she was attacked. Her fingernails were short and clean, and there was no blood on them. They had been cleaned with some sort of brush. Della did fight. Her fingernails were long and false, and she lost three of them. Did Marlowe have any scratches on his body when we searched him? Birkin asked. No, he didn't, Tennyson replied. We have no evidence to prove that he killed Della or that he went to her apartment with Karen's body, but I still think he's a murderer. Otley went to see Kernan. We're not making progress, he said. She's making a mess of this case. Let her continue, Kernan said. We can't get rid of her unless there's a good reason. The best thing you can do is try to cooperate with her. I miss Shefford, Otley said. He was a good policeman, and he was my friend. We all miss him, Bill. But you have to work with Tennyson, whether you want to or not. As Otley left Kernan's office, he met Maureen Havers. She was carrying a pile of reports on murders in the north of England, in places which Marlowe had visited. Otley helped her carry the papers. If you find anything in Oldham, Maureen, let me look at it first. OK, Maureen said. Chapter 8 Connecting Evidence Maureen Havers complained to Sergeant Otley. It was the third Sunday she had worked, and she did not like it. She put a pile of boxes on the desk. It's Sunday. I should be at home with my family, not working. Have you found any murders reported in Oldham? Maureen pointed at his desk. The file is on there. Birkin ran into the room. He had a newspaper in his hand. Look at this, he said. Jane Tennyson was at home. She hated cooking, but she had promised to make a meal for Peter's friends the following night. Her sister Pam was helping her to plan the menu. The sisters were very different. Jane had no patience with housework. Pam loved it. She had married soon after she had left school and had two children. Her third child was due in the next two weeks. Peter came into the room carrying a newspaper. Look at this, he said. On the front page of the newspaper was an interview with Marlowe. I'm innocent, the story in the newspaper said, but the police are following me and making me look like a criminal. There was a picture of Tennyson and some other officers on the case. That spoiled everything, Jane said. We can't ask witnesses to identify Marlowe when they've seen his picture in the newspapers. And these photographs show which officers are following him. She picked up her coat. I'm going to the police station. In the interview room, someone had pinned a copy of the newspaper on the wall. Angrily, Tennyson tore it down. OK, she said. We've all seen the newspapers. Otley smiled. Some of them say that women police officers shouldn't be in charge of murder cases like this. Before Tennyson could reply, Maureen came in. Kernan wants to talk to you, she said. Otley told the officers to start work again. 
we have a list of murders which took place in the north of England. I want you to check for any that happened when Marlow was in the area. Have you finished looking at the Oldham reports? Maureen asked him. Not yet, Otley replied. He had looked through some of them, and he knew there was a problem. He was not certain what to do next. When Tennyson came back, she told them what Kernan had said. Marlow is no longer being followed officially, so I want four officers to watch him without Kernan knowing. What else did Kernan say? Birkin asked. If I don't get some evidence against Marlowe soon, I'm being moved off the case, she said quietly. The officers worked all day and late into the night. We have several cases which we need to look at, Otley told Tennyson. Murders in Oldham, Southport and Warrington. Make a list of the officers who are available and send them up to investigate. See if there is any connection with Marlowe, she said. After Otley left, Maureen Havers asked, Why is Otley so interested in Oldham? Does he have family up there? What do you mean? Tennyson said. Well, he asked me for the reports on murders in Oldham, and now he said he wants to go up there tomorrow. Slowly, Tennyson realised what Maureen was saying. Let me look at the Oldham reports. There was one case which interested her. Jeanie Sharp, aged 21, a prostitute, murdered in 1984. The head of the investigation was Detective John Shefford. Why was Otley so interested in this case? It had to be connected with Shefford. She decided that she would go to Oldham tomorrow, not Otley. Good morning, Jane said to Peter as he came into the kitchen. Where were you last night? he asked. I came in late, so I slept in the other bedroom. I didn't want to wake you. Peter did not reply. I'll come home as early as I can tonight, Tennyson said. I haven't forgotten your friends are coming for dinner. I'll be in Oldham all day. She ran out of the apartment. Peter stood looking at the door. Oldham? That's two hundred miles away. When they arrived in Oldham, Tennyson and Jones were met by Sergeant Tomlins. He told Tennyson and Jones about the murder of Jeanie Sharp. She was found in an empty building, he said. She was tied. Her face was badly cut, clothes torn off. It's a nasty place to die, Tennyson said. Well, these prostitutes ask for it. She was only twenty-one years old, Sergeant, Tennyson replied angrily, but Tomlins was already walking away. You can talk to some of her friends, he said. They're all prostitutes, too. We try to clean them off the streets, but they're like rats. They keep coming back. The apartment was cold and damp, but somebody had tried to make it look cheerful. Tennyson was sitting in an old chair, beside a table on which there were two full ashtrays. She was talking to two of the dead girl's friends, Carol and Linda. Carol, a badly dressed but attractive woman in her thirties, was telling her about the last time she had seen Jeanie alive. We came out of the pub. There was a car parked near the corner of the street. What sort of car? Tennyson asked. A dark one. Linda said. I think it was dark, and it had a lot of silver on the front. Anyway, the driver called out to Jeanie. He called out? You mean he knew her name? I don't think he called her name, just asked her how much. She went over and got into the car. We never saw her again. Tennyson showed them the newspaper photograph of Marlowe. Was this him? I don't know. He had dark hair, but I didn't see his face. The police who were working on the case were horrible, Carol said. There was one. Shefford was his name. They got rid of him. 
Why? Tennyson asked. I suppose they found out about him and Jeanie, Carol said. He was one of her customers. He said he'd look after her. Poor kid, Linda said. She had a bad life. Then she ended up tied up and dead in some empty building. It was late. Peter checked his watch. He was waiting for Jane to come home. The front door crashed open and Jane ran in. I'm sorry. We were late getting back from Oldham. Don't worry. The meal will be ready before your friends arrive. She was right. When Peter's friends arrived, dinner was ready. Two hours later, they were still sitting at the table finishing the wine. Jane was bored, and she had drunk too much. The three men were talking about their work, and their wives only talked about clothes. Peter told me you worked for the police, Sue said. What do you do? Are you a secretary? No, Tennyson said. At the moment I'm investigating a murder. I think some women ask for trouble, Lisa said. What? Ask to be murdered? Jane asked. Uh, not exactly, but... Nobody asks to be murdered, Tennyson said angrily. It could happen to you. The telephone rang and Jane went to answer it. As she left the room, she heard Peter say, Sorry about that. Don't apologise for me, Jane shouted. I can speak for myself. After the guests had gone, Jane said, Well, I think they enjoyed themselves. Do you? Peter asked. Did you have to start talking about those women and your case? Why shouldn't I? Because it's always you, Jane. Your job, your life, you, 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 you don't care about anybody else. That's not true. You care about your officers, your victims, your prostitutes. You give all your time to them. That's my job. Tonight was for my job and my friends, but you still have to take over. Suddenly Jane felt very tired, too tired to argue. Look, she said, I'm sorry. I drank too much wine, and those people were so boring. Do you ever think how boring you are when you talk about work all the time? How many times have we talked about George Marlowe? Do you know how boring that is for me? Peter, I've said I'm sorry. She began to cry. She cried for the girls she had seen that day, the prostitutes whose lives were so sad and so dangerous. Peter knelt down beside her. I'm sorry, love. Let's go to bed. We'll talk tomorrow. Jane went to bed, but she could not sleep. Next morning, when she got up, the kitchen was still full of dirty dishes and food as it had been the night before. She put on her coat. I've been thinking, Peter, she said. I love you. But you're right. I put my work first. It is more important to me than anything else. I don't think I can change, because I'm doing what I always wanted to do. I have to put everything into my work. She was telling him that she could never be the sort of woman he wanted. Somebody knocked at the door. That'll be my car, she said. You'd better go. I don't know what time I'll be home tonight. Peter stood in the kitchen after she left, looking at the dirty dishes. Then he reached out and knocked them all to the floor. Tennyson sat silently next to Jones as he drove. Finally, he spoke to break the silence. Are you okay? I want Marlowe's car found, Tennyson said. Trouble at home. My wife was angry when I was so late getting home. My dinner was burned. The difference is that you get your dinner cooked for you. I have to cook as well as everything else. 
Kernan had come in early to talk about the Marlowe case. He stood and watched as Tennyson and Otley shouted at each other. George Marlowe was questioned in 1984 about the murder of a prostitute called Jeanie Sharp. John Shefford was one of the officers on the case. He was moved to London because it was discovered that he was having a relationship with the murdered girl, Tennyson said. None of this has been put in the files. We now know that he was having a relationship with Della Mornay. He must have known that he identified the wrong girl. He was hiding something. Otley was very angry. That's a lie. If John Shefford was alive, he's not alive. He's dead. And now you're protecting him. You requested the Oldham reports because you knew Shefford was involved. That's not true, Kernan interrupted. That's enough. Calm down, both of you. Sir, Tennyson said, I've been working as hard as I can to solve this case. George Marlowe is still my only suspect for both of the London murders and a possible suspect for the murder of Jeanie Sharp. I don't know anything about Jeanie Sharp's murder, Otley said. I know some of the officers are friendly with these girls. Friendly? Kernan banged his hand on the desk. Be quiet! Did Shefford think there was a connection between the first murder and Jeanie Sharp? I don't know, Otley replied. I wanted to check the case. When I read the report, I saw John's name. I wanted to see what it was about. Kernan nodded then said, "'You've got work to do. You can go now.' Otley hesitated. It was obvious Kernan wanted to talk to Tennyson by herself. He turned to her. "'Maybe we got off to a bad start,' he said. "'I was upset by John's death. Maybe I should have taken a holiday.' She nodded. After he had gone, Kernan said, "'What do you want to do?' I want Otley taken off this case, and I want an officer I worked with before brought in, Detective Ampson. He's a good man, and I want Marlowe watched all the time. Kernan nodded. He knew that this was the price he must pay to hide the mistakes which Shefford and Otley had made. As Tennyson crossed the car park, Otley came over to her. Look, I'm sorry, he said. I think we started badly. Would you like to come for a drink so we can talk? Tennyson shook her head. Has Kernan spoken to you? Otley shook his head. No. Look, I didn't know about John working on the Genie Sharp case. Yes, you did, Tennyson said quietly. You're off the case, Bill. I've brought in someone else. And I want the names of all the officers on this case who have been friendly with prostitutes. Otley stared back at her, but there was no anger left in him. She gave him a small nod and walked towards a car that had just come into the car park. It was driven by the new detective, Terry Ampson. Glad I'm back working with you, he said. How's it going? Tennyson smiled. I think I'm doing okay. Otley's sad figure was still standing there as they drove away.